Welcome to Manifold. Today, my guest is T.P. Huang. T.P. is a Twitter, or should I say X, poster who covers areas of Chinese technology and China-U.S. tech competition. I have followed his writings for some time. He is very insightful and Often when I'm thinking through consequences of some new information that comes out, for example, today we're going to talk about Huawei's Mate 60 launch and what this says about the chip competition and the AI competition between the US and China. I notice that of all the different sources that I read on the internet, TP is often one of the few people that puts together the pieces and extrapolates correctly into the future in, in looking at his past analysis, often what he has suggested will come true actually does come true. So I'm very excited to have TP uh, on the podcast. He works uh, in a quantitative field and has a background in computer science. TP, welcome to the podcast. Oh, hi, Steve. Thanks for welcoming me on the show. Great. Great to have you. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how you got interested in this subject, how you follow this subject, because I, I think you're bilingual, and maybe what are some of the best resources? Yes, so I got into this subject because one, I'm Chinese American. I was born in China and then I, I you know, uh, grew up outside of China and then I came to America for work. And during this time, I have, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, connection to both both countries and I found the entire tech war to be uh, extremely interesting. So I made it a personal priority to read up as much on the topic as I, as I can. And I would say that it involves a lot of going through all the sources, the Chinese language sources I can find online of different companies investigating every company that that's uh, listed on the stock market that are semiconductor related in China and uh, reading their research report that analysts put together. I also have some insider sources, I would say, in the Chinese semiconductor industry. Not many, but a couple that helps me out a little bit. And I've spoken to a lot of people with, on the subject just to make sure that I'm thinking the right direction and I think over time, just by reading through all these different sources and knowing both China, Chinese society and American society and how we think a little bit and the competition that we have, I think over time, I have been able to have a, you know, a, a picture of where the competition right now and what are some of the areas that are things I should be focusing on and others should be focusing on, you know, going forward. Can I ask, uh, to what extent is it kind of a purely intellectual interest of yours? So for me, I, I like to follow this stuff just because, wow, this is, these are really important events that are going to shape the future of our world. I don't actually trade like financially on my insights in this area. I just kind of do it as an intellectual exercise the same way I would follow some you know, subdiscipline of physics or some other science. I'm curious uh, whether that's true as well for you. Are you, or are you, did you a uh, short Apple right before it tanked? <laughs> no, I actually, you know that on my, on my Twitter profile, I actually post the most about EVs and BYD. So I am long BYD, but more because I have a, I think they're going to do well. But in general, I do this as pure of a academic, just interest level kind of topic. And also because I, you know, as a Chinese American, I really do hope that, uh, you know, we can work through things between the two countries. Yes. I think it's, you know, we could have a positive sum game between the U.S. and China, <laughs> not a zero negative sum game that we're involved in right now. You know, I, I should mention that I think I actually became aware of you originally because of EVs, because, and, and, and to my audience, I would love to have TP back if, if he has a good time talking to me for the next hour. I would love to have him back to do a whole nother episode on EVs because EVs and batteries uh, are another area that I've been following. 
And if you want to follow that, you have to understand what's happening in China. And, and that's all actually what led me to TP in the first place. And then only later did I realize, oh, this guy's also following what's happening in the chip war and, and his insights on, you know, what's just happened in the last six months have I think have been very good. But I would love to have him back. Uh, and we may have another episode on EVs and batteries. That, that would be great. Oh, good. So good. I, I've booked you. I've booked you now for another episode. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay. So TP, let's talk about what just happened. I mean, it was literally like, I think a week ago, right? And we can set the stage a little bit. My audience probably knows some, you know, has some general understanding of this, but it's always good to like lay down some specific facts. So U.S. has imposed very aggressive sanctions on Chinese companies uh, related to the manufacture or even in some cases buying of advanced semiconductors chips. And Huawei, which a few years ago was actually either number one or number two in global smartphone sales, had pretty much fallen off the map and people were questioning whether they would even survive as a company in the handset business. Now, of course, they're quite strong in 5G networking and, and infrastructure, but in the smartphone business, handset business, people were questioning whether they would survive. So I think both you and I were surprised when they announced the launching of a flagship phone, which is built using some very advanced seven nanometer chip technology. So maybe you can just react to what I just said. Yes, Steve. So I think if we go back a little bit, obviously the uh, the sanctions on Huawei itself started before uh, the October 2022 sanctions. Those were, you know, Huawei got put on the entity list at a very early point, maybe 2018, 2019 range. And then at a certain point, there was more rounds of sanctions that prevented companies like TSMC from actually uh, making the chips that Huawei itself designed. And uh, the last round of those sanctions around, I would say 2019 or 2020, basically uh, stopped Huawei from making any kind of 5G phones. Their phone business only survived because the U.S. government uh, basically gave uh, permission for Qualcomm to to sell some of their flagship uh, Snapdragon SOCs to Huawei for both their phone business and uh, pad business. And uh, obviously, there's you know I think their their laptop are still using Intel chips, so they they still they still did buy some American chips during this time, but because they were cut off from the five G uh, space, they were becoming increasingly non competitive in the five G market in China. Uh, whereas before the the sanctions, they were actually uh, competing with Apple for the the top end phones in China. You can see after the Huawei sanctions, I think the the number was that Apple sold 34 million phones in China in 2019, and it sold 58 million in 2022, something around there. So there was about a 20 million handset pickup for iPhones after Huawei got you know strangled in this case. So that was quite the blow to Huawei's bottom line. And uh, heading into this year, they said they were actually turning things around and uh, finally. Uh, reverse the sliding revenue declines, but uh, in terms of 5G, we still didn't really know where they are. And uh, we also know that even though they were still turning a small profit, but they were spending so much money on the you know, R&D and they were giving a lot of bonuses to their employees that they were actually bleeding cash. So they, you know, financially, they weren't at the best position at the start of this year. And so that's kind of brings up to the start of the year. It was also at this point around uh, January or December that I first heard about uh, return of Huawei 5G phone rumors from a pretty good source. And at the, at the time, that person actually said the Huawei SOC, which is, you know, system on chip is what the small uh, main chip that you use on your smartphones. Uh, he said at the time that the SOC that Huawei will use is actually a stacked 12 nanometer chip. So, you know, stacking or advanced packaging is, you know, something that uh, chip designer, chip makers use to, I guess, 
improve the performance of chips, if you, if you can think about it that way. And the idea was people thought that China itself was not able to make any more seven nanometer chip or they, you know, they never had a, a really a solid process with high enough yield for commercial usage. So 12 nanometer made a lot of sense at, at the time because it seemed like that was the best uh, technology that was available to Huawei domestically at the time. So I actually tweeted about this news and that surprised a lot of people, but uh, it's, it turned out to be wrong because they ended up with a more advanced process, but uh, you know, they, you can see that they have been working on this for quite a while. And I also had known from a, from a, a sort of a, you know, source that SMIC, I think I'll just call them SMIC from now, just it's easier to say. So SMIC had, was actually producing seven nanometer uh, wafers. They were, uh, they were doing seven, seven nanometer chip making and they were doing quite a bit of it, but nobody knew at the time who the customers were. It wasn't a, uh, obvious from just looking at their usual customers that we know that had been using the 12 nanometer or 14 nanometer process, who was actually doing, buying the seven nanometer production from SMIC. So we just, I had my intuition at the time was Huawei, but you know, obviously that was all not confirmed for a long time. And throughout the, throughout the year, as uh, we went on, uh, you start seeing Huawei's uh, chip design business starting to pick up more steam. You start seeing like Huawei really uh, promoting its AI technology, its, you know, Ascend MPUs, and you start seeing more companies out there working with Huawei. And you start seeing uh, some of their former well-known Campoon server CPUs starting to make it way, make it its way into market again. So the, at that time, I suspected they were getting new productions from SMIC, but I was, you know, I wasn't, to, I was, I didn't know for sure. So I didn't really want to report on that. Quick clarification on that for their AI slash server side chips. Do we know that those are on a seven nanometer process? So we do not know for sure that the current ones are seven, seven nanometers, but we know that when the original S7, 910, you know, MPUs came out and when the Campo 920 uh, CPUs came out, they were using TSMC 7 nanometer process. Got it. So let me just clarify a few background things for my listeners. So number one, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that caught my eye about Huawei as a company, uh, this is many years ago, maybe five years ago or more, when the Mate 10 was their flagship. Now they're up to the Mate 60. Uh, Huawei is well known as an infrastructure provider for telecoms. And so they are the main provider for the infrastructure that provides 5G uh, connectivity. And, but that's mainly sold to carriers, carriers like uh, Deutsche Telekom, for example. When they got into the handset business, I realized that not only were they making world-class handsets, but they had a chip design arm called High Silicon, High Silicon. And High Silicon designed, I believe, the first flagship level, uh, I don't know if you would call it the S an SOC at the time, but anyway, a CPU used in phones. And I remember I bought uh, one of their early models just to see if the that early Kirin processor was any good, and it, it was actually quite good. So Huawei has strength in chip design, and uh, as both TP and I mentioned, at one time they were probably the strongest competitor to Samsung slash Apple in the uh, handset business. Now, the other thing that they do is design, for example, AI chips. And so High Silicon has an AI chip uh, called, uh, it's an NPU, so neural processing unit, or it's also sometimes you would call that a GPU. And that competes against NVIDIA's, for example, A100. So it's, it's quite a powerful company with capabilities across a huge spectrum of technologies and possibly now getting into chip into actual uh, semiconductor fabrication not not clear yet we don't know but anyway that's a little bit of background on Huawei's uh, technological capabilities 
Yeah, they're definitely a very impressive company from a chip designing point of view. If you talk to the people on the street, like involved in the semiconductor business in China, they would say that High Silicon is by far the the most capable chip designing uh, chip designing firm in China. And they actually lost some people to different other companies uh, because of the sanctions. And some people, I guess, felt they lost faith in just the entire business model, but um, they, they're still very, very strong. Yeah. So just to clarify, so High Silicon is a world-class chip design house for yes. or ARM for Huawei, but they were dependent on TSMC to actually physically fabricate the chips. And so when the sanctions hit, uh, in a way, there was not nothing for High Silicon to do because they couldn't get their designs manufactured. I do want to mention that one of my postdocs, uh, a former theoretical physicist who worked with me for several years, his first job when he left physics was as an AI researcher at Huawei's, I don't know if Huawei, Huawei still has a Silicon Valley lab, but when he started working for Huawei, he was working in the Silicon Valley lab. And uh, he's since risen to uh, the role of director of AI for one of the major cell phone companies in China that... Uh, and, and as you may know, a lot of the photography, the photo the capabilities for photography on handsets is due to AI. And so there's a huge number of people that work on image processing and low light imaging, et cetera, et cetera. And these are, these are people who are specialists in a, a certain type of AI. So I, I do have some, have, have some insight into what, what Huawei is like as a company through my, my former postdoc. So let's come back to the announcement TP of this new phone. And maybe you can summarize what are the most like important features or capabilities of this phone uh, that that are going to impact the future. Yeah, I, so I think like when people look at this um, phone, I think too much focus is on the seven nanometer itself and not on what this technology tells us. So the first thing is uh, in generally when you see a country like as big as China make progress, it doesn't make progress only in one area. It's going to be mo making progress uh, most likely at similar paces in different parts of semiconductor industry. So I think that the first thing it tells us if you, you know, if you had a certain view of where China's semiconductor industry is now, you should rethink where their semiconductor industry was back uh, October of 2022 when the sanctions were originally levied. So what this tells us is that in the chip making side of things itself, it's at seven nanometers. But what does this tell us about the other aspect of its uh, semiconductor industry? For example, uh, what does it tell us about its uh, chip making tool, how far advanced are, are those areas? Where is it in the memory chips industry? Uh, where is the rest of the chip design houses in China? Where is it uh, advanced packaging um, industry? How far uh, is it progressing in what we call third generation, fourth generation semiconductor materials like uh, gallium nitride and uh, silicon carbide and also gallium oxide? These are all very important topics, uh, very important technologies uh, for people to think about. And uh, the, the one thing that, there was two things that really surprised me, well, three things actually. One thing was that the chip itself came out to be way more advanced than I expected. Why do I say that? Because of uh, a couple of things. My original expectation was that while SMIC was doing seven nanometer, it was a very early seven nanometer process. So uh, Huawei, if it designs, uh, you know, a, a flagship or any kind of SOC, it will not be at the same level as Snapdragon 8 generation two. And it's also likely to be stacked, which means that it will allow it to have a better performance than your usual seven nanometer process. 
but it turned out that actually it was not stacked. The chip itself was about the same size as the previous uh, Kirin uh, 9000 SOC. And it had its own 5G, integrated 5G modem. It had its own uh, MPU, GPU, and uh, you know, DSPs. All the things that you would want to have on like a flagship SOC that's really powerful. And the performance itself actually ended up being better than what I expected too. In terms of uh, things like power consumption, it was obviously not at the same level as you would see from a four nanometer or a five nanometer process, but it was better than a uh, Snapdragon 888, which was, you know, came out two years ago. And it had really good peak performance and uh, they were able to use what, what's called hyper-threading in their CPUs to get it to uh, have uh, performance that are as good as Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. And while that process itself utilized a lot of power, you know, overall, it's, people are not going to be using their phone uh, at max uh, power or max uh, requirement for a long period of time. So even if it's a little inefficient at the higher end, it's not something that's going to degrade the performance so much that it can't be a flagship phone. So, so obviously the, the SOC itself was actually very impressive based on what kind of process they had. It turned out later that the SMIX process was not as advanced as I thought when I first saw the some of the test results. So that actually spoke more for the, how well designed the chip itself was. So the SOC itself was, it was impressive. On top of that, they also had their own 5G uh, RF front end. So this will be for things like when you, when the signals come in, there are switches that will then go through power and amplifiers which then goes through like what they call BAW filters and then, uh, you know, gets converted to signals that you, you process in your 5G modem. And this is an industry or this, this industry itself has been dominated by American and Japanese companies for a long time for something like BAW filter, which basically is essential to get the 5G signals. Um, well, I think Skyworks or Skyworks or Broadcom have something like 87% market share on it. I can't, I can't remember right now which one it is. And there's basically very few players outside of, of uh, you know, American firms in this. So the fact that uh, Huawei was able to find like a local source for this product was very surprising. So I want to come back to the 5G modem and the RF chips that you just discussed. But before we leave the fab fabrication question, so the seven nanometer process that SMIC, and first of all, I think it's SMIC, but I think you also think it's SMIC, but I'm not sure how fully established that is. They had to use something called multi-patterning because the lithography machines they have available to them are only deep ultraviolet. Uh, the U.S. is not allowing ASML to sell Chinese companies an extreme ultraviolet EUV lithography, lithography machine, which is preferred for the smaller feature sizes. So it was a challenging process to be able to produce seven nanometer level uh, chip features using DUV through something called multi-patterning. And there are questions about what the probable yield is for this process. So I think it's fair to say China will probably be stuck with DUV lithography for at least a few years. Uh, there, we'll talk a little later maybe about their own indigenous DUV mach uh, lithography machines and maybe future EUV machines. But let's just, for the moment, just focus on the following. Let's assume they're stuck at DUV. Uh, what do we know about the yield and the impact of that on the cost of seven nanometer chips made in China right now? Yeah, so there has been a lot of speculations on this topic. Um, certain people online have uh, quoted as low as 10%, which I found to be uh, very hard to believe. 
In general, I would say that uh, there was an article today by Dylan Patel on this topic, and he explored it. And uh, the people that uh, looked at the Kieran Nystalin S from Tech Insight also got interviewed. I think, you know, I would say the yield is over 50% for sure at this point. And it's one of these things that over time, as they get better at it, the yield will keep improving. And in terms of like how high it is, I don't think anyone has a, a, a you know, a, a real knowledge unless you are with Huawei or Smig. So, but my personal perception is it's probably in the seventies by this point because of the, the rumored order size from Huawei. So they are going to be cut off from the American chips uh, supply, most likely. So next year, they're planning something like 60 million phones. That's a, that's a rumor that's out there right now. And on top of the 60 million phones they have, they're probably going to sell 10 million tablets, probably 5 million desktops. And they're also going to need to make uh, server chips and also AI chips. And obviously, as the chips themselves get larger and more complicated, the yield gets lower. So when, when I did the calculation for these things, it would be very hard for them to produce that many chips or anything even close to it, unless they feel confident that the yield for something as small as a 110 millimeter squared SOC is in the seventies, I would say. And I wouldn't be surprised if you guessed it, you know, 80 at 80s at some point based on the Dylan Patel article. So, so yield, in my opinion, at least for the, the, the phone, the phone SOC itself should be okay. Uh, now in terms of costs, can I just comment on that a little bit? The, the guy who's leading these efforts at SMIC, who brought a huge team with him which included both Korean and Taiwanese engineers, was actually the guy responsible for getting both Samsung and TSMC, right, down to uh, very small feature sizes. So so they have a lot of experience, right, uh, in doing this. Oh, um, yes. This guy's done it before. And I, just to, re, just to uh, summarize what you're saying, we at least on certain things, like I think the number of cell phone orders uh, that they're willing to take, uh, Huawei, and also the fact that they even launched another phone using, I think, the foldable phone, which is also using, I think, the same chip. It does express some level of confidence. Like they, they do seem to think they're going to be able to produce huge volumes of chips like the Kirin 9000S. And so then you would infer from that that they do, they're either, I mean, they could be making a mistake, but they themselves are clearly confident that they have the, some level of control over the yield. Is that fair? I, I would say so. Got it. Okay. So now one of the calculations you did, which I thought was the most impressive, uh, it caught me by surprise, is you you said you actually calculated like how much were they paying to Qualcomm? Like if they launched a handset and but they had to buy the the the, the SOC from Qualcomm, they were paying Qualcomm, you know, whatever, maybe 160 bucks or whatever it was. Uh, but instead they they keep that if it's their chip right? The money goes back to Huawei if it's a Kirin chip. And so they could tolerate somewhat more expensive fabrication costs uh, because they're now no longer paying if, if effectively like the profit margin of Qualcomm. So maybe you could talk about those numbers. Yeah. So one of the things that surprised me was just how expensive the, uh, the latest Snapdragon SOCs came out to be. The ones that Huawei itself bought are actually not the generation two or the generation three Snapdragon 8 SLCs, it bought the first generation ones, uh, which probably weren't, ex weren't as expensive, but if it actually wanted to stay in the smartphone business going forward without having its own flagship chips, it would probably have to pay the $160 per, I think it was 160 or 140, but the, the gen three actually, I saw as high as $180 per SLC. So, if you just do like a you know calculation head, if they were to sell uh, 50 million phones next year, uh, $180 per per phone multiplied by 50 million, that will come out to be 
$9 billion a year. And based on that, I calculated that even if the cost of fabricating for smoke was as high as the uh, TSMC five nanometer process, just, you know, based on all the tools that they have to buy and the, uh, you know, the amortization, depreciation costs associated with it, they could charge, like Smith could charge the same price as what uh, TSMC charges for five nanometer wafers. And uh, why we could buy that and they would still be able to uh, pay a lot of money to their employees, uh, do all the testing and uh, packaging required and still profit like a 50% margin on those things. It was, the mass was really mind blowing to me why. Like calculated it. Yeah, you were the first person I saw who actually looked careful at these numbers. I was actually a little disappointed in the Wall Street guys because the Wall Street guys should have been on this right away, but they, I didn't see any similar analysis for a while from these guys um, because that was a tradable event, right? If you, if you figured out like, oh, wait a minute, they could really do this. That's going to have a bunch of it. Like, I think you were ahead of these guys by like at least 24 hours or something. Now, as far as I understand it, the, the, the cost per chip is scaling more or less linearly with yield, right? So if I get slightly less yield, I just have to run the process more, like one over the delta in the yield and, and pay for that. So it increases the per unit cost. But like if you're varying within 50 to 70%, sure, you maybe pay a little bit more for the chip, but you didn't have an alternative, right? Either your alternative was either to pay a, a huge profit margin to Qualcomm for that chip or not have the chip at all because you're sanctioned by the US government, right? So it seemed like even if their yield wasn't that great, they still might have a business opportunity there. Sure, yeah. I, I think the business case is there. I think the bigger question is whether they have enough equipment to actually run the process. A yeah. lot of people actually look at the process and they say, well, okay, so Spec has this many lithography machines. Okay, so based on these lithography machines, I think they can uh, run, they can produce this many advanced seven nanometer chips. And I look at that and I say, well, they also need other equipments also. And while, while SMIC itself is probably has enough lithography machines to increase production, but it doesn't have enough of the etching machines, you know, many of the other kind of equipments that you need for the high volume production because they lost access to LAM and uh, AMAT, you know, within the past year, obviously. So there is a question of if they can ramp up the production and capacity as SMIC uh, through domestic equipment producers. Right. And so that's an open question, right? Yes. I think, you know, I think if, if we go back to what I talked about before, if we have been underestimating where uh, SMIC's uh, seven nanometer uh, manufacturing capability is, we may also be underestimating where the uh, the different uh, equipment manufacturers are at in terms of their the quality of their equipment and such. Right. So th this whole this thing ties into all these issues, like like how far along is AMEC, right? Uh, uh, so one of the things is, you know, if the premise is the people at Huawei are not idiots, and clearly they're not, and the calculations on like, okay, what capacity do we actually have for all of these different aspects of the production chain? That surely those guys can figure it out, right? They, they talk to their counterparts at SMIC. They talk to, you know, and I, I guess there's been talk of like mysterious buying of used DUV machines and all kinds of other stuff going on. You would guess that they have this lined up. Like if, if they actually say they're going to, they're going to have tablets and, you know, uh, server chips and AI chips then probably they sort of can see the path to actually producing them. Yeah, I, th I think people should focus a little bit less on a lithography machine because I'll just tell you right now, SMIC has enough lithography machines to increase the production by a lot. Right. So, so the, and you need about, for 50,000 wafers per month of seven nanometer, you need about 20 advanced uh, RF, uh, DUV lithography machines. And based on my estimates, they have more than that right now. Right, right. So the bottleneck would might be in other stuff, but the other equipment 
they would know if they have a, these guys, that calculation, these calculations are pretty straightforward. So they would know if like the bottleneck's going to be shifted into some other aspect of the production process and they would know it well in advance, I think. Yeah. And I think they are actively validating the domestic tools right now. Yeah. So a lot of the, some, I think of all the equipment manufacturers from China, AMAC is probably the one that's most vocal about its progress. And it has shown some really remarkable improvements in the processing that it supports. Uh, if you look at their, you know, the presentations for both uh, memory chips and logic chips. So my guess is that Huawei looked at it and then they, based on their own estimation, they think SMIC will be able to support all their, all their chip needs. Yeah. So, so uh, when I talk about that, I, I don't mean just by phones or computers or things like that. I'm talking about, uh, earbuds, where, uh, your, your, your smart watches, your TVs, smart home, everything. Like they're going to need SMIC to produce all the stuff for them. Right. So again, there are certain assumptions made in this chain of reasoning that we're discussing, but it leads to a scenario in which I think you alluded to this in your comments across the whole production chain for semis, China is the gap is less than what we thought. And Huawei's behavior, again, under these assumptions is suggesting that the domestic producers for some of these other categories, like which compete with AMAT or compete with LAM or whatever, that gap is closed faster than people expected. Is that fair? I would say so. And I don't think it would have closed as quickly if there wasn't the October sanction because it actually forced SMIC, for example, to work with AMAC alum more closely because they, they don't really have a choice. This is a point that I make a lot to people, which I think if you're not, if you've never been a startup guy or a business guy, you don't understand this point. So as a startup guy, I am confident that my team because we're focused, we don't have bullshit, we don't have bureaucracy, we're focused and we recruit only the top talent. I feel confident that I can match up with the corporate team at a big company. The thing that hurts me is nobody wants to go with a startup. Nobody wants to buy the machine from a startup. There's so many risks. We could run out of money. We might not be able to scale up fast enough to meet their demand if they commit to our technology. There's so many reasons why uh, startups fail. Generally, tech is not one of them. It's not usually, if it's, a, if it's a mature product that I'm trying to match an existing large company that's building that product, the, the technology I can catch up on, the problem is these other issues. But once you sanction the entire Chinese economy and you say, hey, guys, you're not going to be able to buy these things from the US or the Japanese or the Dutch vendors, then the question is purely a tech competition. Can the startups in China then close the gap? On certain things like EUV, which are really hard, it's going to take a long time to close that gap. But a lot of things which are nevertheless just standard components of semiconductor pro uh, production process, I am confident that small companies could close those gaps if given the opportunity. So the way I would say it is the US sanctions solved a kind of alignment problem or coordination problem within China, which basically forced all these companies to work together. And it's to the benefit of all the startups that are trying to catch up. So that, that's how I explain this. At least I'm not sure that's actually the situation. And that description might only apply to certain subsets of the production chain. But as a general remark, the U.S. did, in a sense, a huge favor, at least to the startups in China that are trying to catch up on technology. Yeah. So, Steve, I'll, I'll use an example of this, of something I read from someone, you know, who works at uh, SPIC. And uh, it's regarding to their new fab in what they call the Jingcheng fab. It's actually... It's called Jingcheng because it's in Beijing. And one of the things about that fab is when SMIC opened it up, they wanted to make it a de-Americanized production line. And people that are in charge of uh, getting the yield up in SMIC was really not happy about it because they said, we prefer to use AMAT equipments because we can get 90% yield or 28 nanometer process using AMAT, material, AMAT equipments. But using these Chinese equipments, we can only get 75%. And I'm gonna get penalized on this. So, but you know, uh, the company itself actually uh, pressured it, you know, said we have to go this direction because 
we could get sanctioned. It turned out that, that you know, the entire industry in China did get sanctioned. So over time, obviously the, the, the domestic producers will improve their, in their quality and they'll work with the, the major fabs in China to actually improve their yields until at least for things like 28 or 40 nanometer or in 14 nanometers, they catch up to the same quality as, uh, or some, something close to where AMAT and LAN is at. You know, a, a lot of the sentiment of Americans who, you know, are hawkish on China, they're like, we want, we got to smash these Chinese guys. We can't let them catch up with us technologically, blah, blah, blah. Even if you have that sentiment, a very, you have a very strong desire to keep them down, you fear them, you loathe them, et cetera. This still might be the wrong strategy. The, the current sanctions, which are put in by people, I think, who fundamentally don't understand technological innovation or semiconductors, it could be a, a bad move for the US, even if you had as your goal just crushing the Chinese, you know, techno tech innovation landscape. So I think that's something people have to consider. You can't just say, like, oh, I'm doing something mean to Chinese companies, so it must be good. But the world is not that simple. Yeah, I, I would say you're completely right about that. I mean, China is not Russia or Iran. It has a lot of uh, resources at hand, a lot of money at hand to uh, throw these problems. Yeah, it, if you calculate the number of engineering type graduates from Chinese universities, it's you're talking about easily something like 5x. And if you, you know, it could even be 10x times the U.S., so that if, if you, this is another point I sometimes make, which is that if you look across many areas of technology, whether it's space, satellite communication, uh, semiconductors, EVs, uh, AI, quantum computing, material science, chemistry, you, you name it, they have enough human capital that if the other conditions are right, they can catch up. And catching up is easier than innovating. So, you know, it's a separate question of whether once they get to the, innovation frontier, whether they can push it forward as fast as the Americans can. But catch up is really constrained by capital, human capital and financial capital. And uh, everything I see across all of those different subsectors shows that they're catching up extremely fast and in some cases surpassing uh, the West. So I, I think people are just not aware of the numbers, the scale of how much human capital they have to draw on. Definitely agreed. So let's now, we were talking about fabrication. Let's now shift to the modem and uh, RF chips. So the point that you made, which is that, you know, first of all, 5G modems are pretty hard, right? Right now, everybody is basically, except Huawei now, dependent on Qualcomm, right? Apple was trying to actually develop its own 5G modem for its phones at the moment, as far as I understand, hasn't succeeded. And so they've put in large orders, I think even for the next iPhone, is it iPhone 15, 14 or 15? They put in orders, it's gonna be Qualcomm 5G modems in those phones, right? So I think it's, they're, they're getting until 2026. Yeah, so it's a tough technology. Anybody who says like, oh, these Chinese guys can't innovate. It's too hard, you know, but nevertheless, within Huawei, it seems, they've managed to actually build a 5G modem uh, chip or chipset, which is comparable to Qualcomm. As far as I can tell from all the independent tests, so if you go on Chinese internet, you can see guys uh, in places in China where they have a real 5G network and they're downloading almost gigabit per second speeds uh, to their phones from the wireless network. Uh, and they they compare the 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 Mate 60 against the latest iPhone, and it seems like Mate 60 is at least as good or comparable. So it does seem that there's evidence that they've closed this 5G modem gap. Do you, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think the ongoing joke online on China is just how bad the iPhone signals are in China compared to everyone else. And I think there the, the, one of the rationale is that iPhone doesn't have an integrated modem to their SLC because it uses the the Qualcomm modem. Right. But I was actually very impressed, not just with the modem itself, but its integration with all the front end analog chips that we talked about that 
you just never know when a new player is coming into an industry. They can say they have, we, we have a product that's comparable to uh, Skyworks or uh, Broadcom products. But you, you, until you test it out and verify with your system, you really don't know. So, so what we actually saw is Huawei not only doing an advanced SOC and the 5G modem to it, they also cultivated a domestic RF supply chain from almost nothing. Right. So, so RF is radio frequency. And you're talking about the thing that allows this tiny antenna in your phone to connect to a base station or even potentially to a satellite, which we'll talk about in a moment. But so RF technology is, it's, it's very tricky technology. That's real electrical engineering, right? It's like you're, you're talking about the signal processing, pretty hard stuff that, you know, honestly, like as a professor in the STEM professor in the US over the last 30 years, the kids who study that, the kids who go to grad school to study that stuff nowadays, chip design, analog chip design, it's generally not Americans, right? Americans who are closer to the money figured out, oh, I can make more money more easily in software or social networking startups, blah, blah, blah. Those kids are not the ones who go into chip design or these really hard EE, electrical engineering type things. It's basically kids from China. And so to say you're surprised that the Chinese can catch up in these areas is kind of to me, like very stupid. It just shows like you don't really understand who's doing this work, even in America. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Like, obviously we know what the, you know, professions in America that you can make the most money and that, that kind of draws people in. Yeah. And you, you were mentioning like, okay, well, the leading, one of the leading companies in this space is Broadcom, like big U.S. chip company, right? And if I said like, well, who's working at Broadcom? What new engineers do they hire or even team leaders who are designing their chips? It's probably not people born and raised in the United States, or if they are born and raised in the United States, they're immigrant kids. So to say you're surprised that they can't, that they could do this in China is like really kind of like just shows, I think, your ignorance of all this. Steve, can I just raise another point I think yeah. hasn't been talked about enough at all? Yeah, go which ahead. Is, which is this. So we talked about how important this radio frequency area is. And we talk about the ex existing engineering talent you have in this, these ama amazing American companies in Qualcomm, you know, Sky Skyworks, Broadcom, and Corbo. And I keep mentioning those four companies because they have existing engineering talent who have years of experience in this field. Now, they, a lot of them, especially Qualcomm, but the other guys also, they get a huge percentage of their revenue actually from uh, Chinese OEMs who use their stuff for their phones, for their tablets, for the, any kind of Wi-Fi front end modules, any kind of smart, smart home modules right now, they use that. So if you think about it, uh, China is the largest you know, international market for sure for them, but also it could be the largest market overall for, for Qualcomm. And then if, Huawei's domestic suppliers can ramp up their production to the point where they can supply all of the Chinese OEMs, then these companies in America, they're going to suffer huge revenue losses. And we know what happens when companies suffer revenue losses in America. Wall Street will tell them to, you need to cut back your expenses, you need to, you know, reduce your headcount. And then when we reduce headcount, what happens in the process is that the best trained engineers we have they don't stay in this industry. They go somewhere else. So then you lose all this talent over time. Yeah, I, you, you were very perceptive again, I think, uh, in pointing out, I think in your tweets or comments, posts, that, you know, if the OEMs who are using these chips to make phones, whether it's Oppo or Xiaomi or Huawei, or even uh, the Apple phones are made in China, it's much easier for a Chinese supplier once they've shown that their chips are comparable quality to Qualcomm and they can produce enough of them for them to get into the production, into the supply chain in China is going to be that much easier, right? Uh, it's a small world, right? So Qualcomm and these other RF chip manufacturers, I think their future revenues are definitely a risk now. Yeah, I did some calculation. I... I would say what, what we know is that 
for each phone, you have about $35 of uh, RF front end. So for uh, the 700 million phones that Chinese OEMs produce every year, uh, you know, that works out to be over $20 billion. And then if we add in all the other stuff, and, you know, the Chinese supplier could also supply Samsung, for example. Uh, you could very well look at a $30 billion pie that gets cut down to much less than that for an American company. And that really cuts down to cuts down R&D. Do these RF chips also have to be made using a 7 nanometer process, or is it more of a trailing uh, edge feature size? Uh, they don't. So, like, this is a really interesting topic. So the two main ones that people care about are the uh, BAW filters which gets made in what's called a men's fab, a uh, micro, microelectronic uh, sensor, I think, something like that. And uh, the port amplifiers use what's uh, use, they get fabbed in what's known as uh, gallium arsenide uh, fabs. So none of these need the latest seven nanometer process for lithography machines, but uh, they're also very technical in their own ways, but they're, they just, you just don't need the latest uh, lithography machines for them. So it's, it's plausible there that the capacity might exist in China for these local manufacturers, local designers of RF chips to actually uh, ship a lot of product. So one, the, the main gallium arsenide uh, foundries are actually in Taiwan. And uh, what they've noticed is that in the past year, uh, the Chinese uh, foundry, which is called San has basically overnight seen its uh, market share climb from 5% of the market to 15% of the market, whereas uh, the Taiwanese uh, gallium arsenide foundries are sitting extremely underutilized. So, and this is a process that's likely to keep going forward. And depending on what happens with the gallium sanctions that China placed down the rest of the world, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens to these uh, foundries. Yeah, it's super interesting. I, you know, there's got to be some uh, analysts who, you know, track semis, semiconductor stocks and companies that, you know, are trying to drill down into this and track this more carefully. And they have to have people on their teams that are fluent in Mandarin, et cetera, so they can, you know, do some boots on the ground research. I, I think there are huge trading opportunities. Not, not that I run a hedge fund that invests in semiconductor stocks, but, but it just seems like an obvious thing that. Uh, a certain amount of research could pay off. You, you and I should start a consultancy for <laughs> <laughs> for a semiconductor analysis. But anyway, let let's talk a little bit about the satellite capability of this phone, which is, I believe, unprecedented. Right, so it allows for voice anywhere with coverage to. Uh, I forgot the name of the Chinese satellite system. Is it Tiantong? Yes, Tiantong. So. That was actually one of the most surprising part of this is incorporation of uh, satellite technology. So beforehand, actually, with Mate 50 and P60, Huawei had already demonstrated uh, uh, two-way SMS capabilities using the Baidu, Beidou navigation system. So that was a new. But this uh, satellite phone capability is actually new. And if you see some of them, map coverage, the Tiantong satellites can cover a good chunk of uh, Southeast, like all Southeast Asia, Japan, Korea, even all the way to like uh, United Arab Emirates. It's amazing. Now, I don't know if it's actually used that far in practice. I think right now, China Mobile, you know, China Telecom is, is saying it's only operational on the ground from within the border of China, but people have already used this on airplanes. So. That's kind of interesting. But the more, the more interesting engineering part of this is they managed to somehow make the chip uh, small enough and still work inside a smartphone. So the old satellite phone we have all looked extremely clunky with huge antennas. And these, the, the Mate 60 clearly are just, just your regular smartphone. And the chip is strong enough to go all the way up to geo satellite, which is really far away. And, and receive signals from that. So and we're going to see more phone from the Chinese market with this capabilities going forward because, uh, you know, other OEMs are going to want to catch up to this capability. Yeah, I, I don't know 
to what extent those capabilities are available from other uh, vendors than Huawei. It could be a unique uh, leapfrog for them uh, that other people can't uh, currently uh, reproduce. In a future podcast, just to advertise, I, I, there is a, uh, a friend of mine whom I've known since we were both students at Caltech, who is the founder and CEO of a company called Link, L-Y-N-K, which is a satellite company, which uh, now their satellites are, I think, low Earth orbit. Uh, their network allows you using an existing cell phone, the existing antenna on your cell phone, which is meant to connect to like a local uh, uh, base station, like in your neighborhood. That same phone can talk to these link satellites that are in orbit. And so he is selling uh, emergency calling from an ordinary existing cell phone through his network to big carriers, uh, uh, telco carriers around the world. So just as an emergency feature mainly. So I'm going to have him on the podcast and we're going to discuss part of what we're going to discuss is what these Huawei capabilities. But it does seem to leapfrog <laughs> anything that I had heard about from other uh, companies or vendors. Yeah, I think like this technology itself, uh, from what I read, it's basically going to be a very important part of the 6G network where you, you're going to have your uh, low Earth orbital satellites, which provide additional uh, transmission, data transmission points so that no matter where you are, if there's no ground stations, you can still get streaming. You can still, you know, download as much data as you want, provided that obviously you're you know, your ships can actually handle this much power without using up all the battery life. Right. So, but, you know, back to, again, like uh, this is something that's kind of popped into my head from reading your analysis. Even if you are, say you are behind TSMC in, you know, chip fabrication. And so, you, you know, your SOS, your, your, your main CPU or GPUs in the phone are a little bit slower or less power efficient and you maybe have to pay a little bit more you know per unit for them these other capabilities in your phone like the sat capability or some other aspect of the phone you know might make the consumer willing to pay more for it so you can trade those things off against each other it's not the simplistic analysis that i hear from a lot of american analysts is like oh seven nanometer that's like five years old and uh they're still way behind and apple's next chip is going to be on a three nanometer process. So surely these guys are way behind. But phone competition, you know, competition between handsets isn't that simplistic. It's like a, a bundle of lots of different features that determine uh, which handset is, is preferable to the other. And, you know, I wouldn't actually, it, it, it's, I think there's already pretty ample evidence that nationalist sentiment in China is going to buoy Huawei sales. People in China understand that the US government unfairly targeted Huawei. And just out of spite, they're going to buy a Huawei phone, even if it's slightly less good than a foreign phone. And so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't underestimate that uh, dynamic. Yeah, I think like most people, when they use their phone, they're not going to know what their power consumption data on their phones. I have no idea any what that is for any of my phones. I don't know what the SOC is on my, you know, Google Pixel phone. I don't really care. Uh, things that people, you know, that, that are like really good advantage for the phone, Mate 60, apparently its camera is really good. Its speaker is really good. Obviously the 5G signals are really good. And it has, uses very advanced fast charging technology. And it's uh, heat dissipation technology is good. So even though with an older process, you generate a lot more heat because the heat dissipation technology is so good that the phone, the surface of phone doesn't really get that much hotter than your four or five nanometer SAC phone. So, oh. so you, you could argue that Huawei's strength in what I call like real engineering, like physical engineering or applied physics, you know, allows them like say their phone charges faster, right? Than an iPhone. Um, it allows them to compensate for, you know, being somewhat behind in the fabrication process for the SOC. And as you also pointed out, people don't notice, people don't really know, unless you're a, a hardcore gamer on your phone, you are actually not going to notice if you have like a, 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 C, a main CPU, which is a couple generations behind uh, the, the leading edge, bleeding edge. In fact, a, 
one of the things that I often complain about on Twitter is that the analysts and strategists in Washington seem to think that they're crippling the Chinese military by cutting off three nanometer, five nanometer process. But no one uses anything like that bleeding edge fab process for weapons, first of all. And secondly, even the AI chips that people uh, are using to train LLMs and things like this, those are seven nanometers. So, so really all you're doing is like crippling your ability to make bleeding edge flagship phone chips, right? Uh, when, you, when you cut off uh, China from three nanometer, four nanometer process. Yeah, so I did some you know, brainstorming of applications that would absolutely need something that's uh, TSMC N5 process or better. And aside from smartphones, I really can't think of something that you really can't use something else for because the main, the main downside of having a less advanced process, like a seven nanometer versus a three nanometer, is that the power consumption numbers are, are worse. You need a bigger chip to get similar level of performance as audio. Those are the kind of things where if you have a phone, it really matters because of space and power constraints. But outside of, uh, even for laptops, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Definitely, and definitely for data centers, you can, uh, you can compensate for that with better liquid cooling of your data centers. You can use better gallium nitride, you know, inverters or, or, some, or things like that to uh, save on power consumptions. Yeah. I think this point is totally lost on the people in Washington who thought they were crippling the Chinese military with these sanctions. It's just totally wrong. Crippling the consumer who wants a phone, who wants a flagship phone. Yeah. But so now that we've gotten onto that, let's talk about the consequences of, suppose it's true that SMIC has plenty of capacity in its seven nanometer N plus two process to make AI chips. So last time I checked, there were companies, design firms like BRN and High Silicon that made AI chips that are actually comparable. I'm not saying they're better or exactly equal to NVIDIA, uh, latest and greatest for NVIDIA, A100 uh, or whatever, but it does seem like they're pretty competitive. And if it is true that there's enough capacity, then we should see a lot of Chinese uh, domestically made and designed chips, which are competing for with NVIDIA chips uh, to be used in AI model training. You want to comment on that? Yeah. So I think in terms of uh, just in terms of uh, NVIDIA and AI, obviously NVIDIA has played a really big role in those early stages of um, LLS and AI development in general. But I think a lot of what got NVIDIA to this point is uh, they're the only game in town, basically. And everyone basically wrote their, back in the days, you know, PyTorch and things like that. Obviously, I'm not an expert in this area, but my understanding is that there's a lot of CUDA developers and also the, these, these AI software or architectures platforms are work optimized to work with CUDA. That's a different situation inside China where uh, Huawei itself is a behemoth when it comes to AI and it has its own stack of Ascend platforms and also uh, what it calls MindSpore. So that's their version of PyPorch. And then that you have uh, uh, Baidu was Paddle Paddle and they have, you know, various platforms domestically for this. And the, the part that I found interesting about Huawei is that it had been training its own developer pool all this time. It has all these Huawei schools to teach people to program in China, to program to ascend to the point where I think, I think I read there was something like 2 million ascend developers in China. Now to put things in perspective, I think the last time I read it was, there was about four to five million, maybe 5 million CUDA developers. So there's still more CUDA developers, but there's a lot of Ascent developers also that are that can write stuff for the uh, Ascent GPU. So while there's actually a lot of uh, quite a few you know AI chip uh, make chip designers in China, like like 
Byron and more threads, meta X, there's quite a few of them, but from a usage point of view, it seems to me that Ascent is, it, it is the most popular one that's being is, used in China by different large language models. In, in fact, in Huawei's own, you know, Ascent uh, press releases and events, they would say that half the LLMs in China are trained using Ascend platform. Which is, you know, you wouldn't know that if you were in America, but so people are suggesting to cut off NVIDIA from China or restricting, make the, you know, restrict the 8800 from China. That will obviously, you know, hurt certain people like uh, Tencent who, uh, you know, wrote them high AI stack around an NVIDIA platform, but they're, it's not going to stop the other people in, that are using the you know, Ascend platform and other platforms. So, right. so that I, yeah. So let me just summarize that for the audience. So CUDA is an acronym for Compute Unified Device Architecture, and it is a platform or a software framework that AI developers use. And the whole uh, framework was developed by NVIDIA. It's specifically for their chips. And so a big part of the lock-in that NVIDIA has is not necessarily just the quality of their chips or GPUs or NPUs, whatever you want to call them, basically chips that are good at huge matrix operations that are necessary for AI. The lock-in is both that their chips are good, but also that they built the software environment or framework that everybody uses. And so it's difficult to retool your code so that it runs well on somebody else's chipset. So that's part of the lock-in that NVIDIA has. What TP has just pointed out is that that isn't completely the case in China. So there are some companies that are probably locked into NVIDIA hardware, but there are a lot of developers in China that could use the, the software framework that's built around Huawei's NPUs or G GPUs uh, called Ascend. So I would actually predict that if the USA just completely cut off China from NVIDIA chips, some companies would be damaged, but over the overall pace of AI development in China would not be hampered by that much, assuming that SMIC does have the capability to manufacture at scale, you know, these seven nanometer designs that uh, have been produced by companies like BRN or uh, High Silver. Is that, is that fair, TP? Yes, I would say so. I, I would say that like uh, NVIDIA itself, it, it... They cut off NVIDIA uh, supply of chips into China. It will definitely hurt certain projects. And they also have what they, you know, in China, a lot of what they talk about in digital economy is just how much computation power we have. The, you know, they have metrics on how to increase the number of e-flops the country has. And the goal is increased by 30% every year. So... A lot of the demand you're seeing from China is this boom for LLMs from different tech um, providers. And whether they actually, whether you actually need that many people creating LLMs at the same time is a different story. I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Uh, but they, they are definitely procuring a lot of GPU power. And the GPU powers they procure, some of it is used for LLMs and some of it is used for just industrial um, AI computations and things like that. So if you cut it off, it's going to hurt some people. It's going to hurt some industries also. But very soon, I think it will just get replaced by domestic production as companies uh, are forced to move from using CUDA to domestic languages, whether it's Ascend or whatever uh, Byron uses or whatever MetaX uses. Right. So, I mean, it, it could be painful in the short run. And there's also this question of whether the U.S. could cut China off completely from, it, you know, advanced processes. So the question of whether SMIC really can scale up seven nanometer uh, will eventually be important, right? But if, if the answer to that question is yes, then, you know, the, the Jake Sullivan motivation for this whole thing which is to hamper Chinese AI development, might not materialize, right? If, if, if SMIC can do seven nanometer at sufficient scale, there is enough chip design talent, software library development talent, all of that infrastructure 
that would allow Chinese AI research to continue uh, pretty much unhampered. I, I mean, on a one, two year time scale, yeah, it could hurt. But beyond that, I, I just don't see it realizing the goals that Jake Sullivan and crew had, you know, for doing this whole thing, this whole crazy thing, which is going to potentially destroy Qualcomm stock price, AMAT stock price, LAM Research's stock price. You know, all of this uh, destruction may not actually achieve the goal that these idiots in Washington had in mind. Yeah, so I think if the goal all along was to uh, stop China's progress or slow down China's progress in AI, I just haven't seen it. I, I've seen the advancements that you know America has made in our arms that are that's not dependent on China being slowed down. That's actually being dependent on American enterprises and companies opening the eye and all these guys making great progress in ChatGPT and all these other things. At the end of the day, you know, this I don't see AI chip production as a limitation factor because most of the it doesn't take that many wafers to produce enough GPUs for China. The, the thing that takes up a lot of wafers are smartphone SOCs, actually, because you're dealing with uh, several hundred million SOCs yeah. that you need eventual. Now, whereas of you course, need maybe a few hundred thousand GPUs. Exactly. I, now, of course, smartphones are a big business. It's economically important in its own right. It's about as relevant to national security as, you know, ladies' handbags, you know, LMHV, <laughs> is it LMVH, whatever, you know, ladies' handbags. And, you know, it's a luxury item that doesn't really affect war fighting capability. And I just, uh, I just feel like these guys in Washington that are in charge of all this do not know what they're doing. Yeah, I definitely don't think they have a good view of where China is and they don't have any technical backgrounds and it, it has shown itself in everything that, that has happened. You know, I, for eight years, I was the vice president for research at a big 10 university in the United States. And one of part of my job was to go periodically to Washington to try to support federal, you know, uh, budgets for science and technology and, you know, talk to people about certain regulatory issues, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, people in Washington probably would hate to hear this, but, you know, within 50 miles of uh, the White House, it's pretty damn hard to find anybody who understands anything about science and technology. You know, you have some people at NIST, maybe that's about it. I don't know. You have some people at NSA, but in general, the people who control the political levels of levers of power in this country really simply don't understand science and technology. And then secondly, they may have completely unrealistic ideas of what's going on in China, which is an independent issue. Yeah, I would say if they were uh, doing their job correctly, they should be sending. So America has really good intelligence operation. I know this because I have some friends who are in certain areas and the intelligence report we get of China is amazing. They, they have so much details on what's going on, military speaking in China. Now, if they could spend some of that resource just by sending people into China to see what the tech development are, and then actually having the politician listen to them and make policies based on those recommendations, I think things will look a lot different. I think if, if, if you know, one of my buddies who runs a big hedge fund said, hey, Steve, why don't you and TP hire up a team of five guys and just figure out, because it looks like a pretty dynamic moment for semis. Uh, and related tech. Uh, and maybe you can figure out some of this stuff because time skills are slow, right? It takes a lot of time to build a fab or, you know, by the time somebody's DUV or EUV machine actually works, a lot of people know it, right? So like, I think like a small team that we built could probably have a better idea of what's going to happen, what the world's going to be like in two years in semis than like anybody in Washington or at the CIA or you know, uh, military intelligence. I just don't think those guys know what they're doing. Well, one thing, I think what this entire past year has taught me and taught some of the things I looked at is just how much it has really forced the Chinese industries, a lot of these OEMs to uh, de-risk. You know, that's a key term people use to de-risk from outside suppliers. 
and I'm reading news right now just about all the components. You know, while we, the phone itself is not just the, the seven nanometer chip, but also the fact that it's something like 90% domestic, something along that line. And once you can make everything 100% inside China, and these companies are looking to de-risk, a lot of Western businesses are going to lose large amount of their revenue because, because of this. Yeah, I, th I think that's the unintended consequence of these sanctions. And even if they tomorrow lifted the sanctions, the risk that the Chinese companies perceive from sanctions being reinstated would force them still to basically go with domestic uh, providers of equipment. And again, I just want to say it again. I know I'm repeating myself, but a, the main barrier to a startup catching up, catching up, not necessarily building something better than, but catching up to an existing big company on a certain product is as much business and trust uh, in the startup, you know, those kinds of issues that they have to overcome as the technology, you know, just actually technology development, because a startup can hire very high quality people, very well motivated people. They have less BS. They're very goal oriented. Generally, they can catch up. They can close the gap with big established companies on most technologies. And the real issue is for them to break into the market because they're small. They, they don't have deep pockets. They could go under at any time. But the US sanctions on China solved that problem because the Chinese companies had no choice but to go with the equipment providers that were in China. And that that's a huge gift to those guys and may have been a, 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 a really bad set of uh, unintended consequences for the US. Totally agree. All right, well, I've, I've kept you a long time. Uh, I appreciate your uh, input. I would love to have you back to talk about EVs sometime, TP. And thanks again for joining me. Thanks, Steve.